The Mysterious Stranger by Mark Twain, Chapter 9 it was wonderful the mastery satan had over time and distance for him they did not exist he called them human inventions and said they were artificialities we often went to the most distant parts of the globe with him and stayed weeks and months and yet were gone only a fraction of a second as a rule you could prove it by the clock one day, when our people were in such awful distress because the witch commission were afraid to proceed against the astrologer and Father Peter's household, or against any, indeed, but the poor and the friendless, they lost patience and took to witch-hunting on their own score, and began to chase a born lady who was known to have the habit of curing people by devilish arts, such as bathing them, washing them, and nourishing them instead of bleeding them and purging them through the ministrations of a barber-surgeon in the proper way. She came flying down with the howling and cursing mob after her, and tried to take refuge in houses, but the doors were shut in her face. They chased her more than half an hour, we following to see it, and at last she was exhausted and fell, and they caught her. They dragged her to a tree and threw a rope over the limb, and began to make a noose in it, some holding her meantime, and she crying and begging, and her young daughter looking on and weeping, but afraid to say or do anything. They hanged the lady, and I threw a stone at her, although in my heart I was sorry for her. But all were throwing stones, and each was watching his neighbor, and if I had not done as the others did— it would have been noticed and spoken of. Satan burst out laughing. All that were nearby turned upon him, astonished and not pleased. It was an ill time to laugh, for his free and scoffing ways and his supernatural music had brought him under suspicion all over the town, and turned many privately against him. The big blacksmith called attention to him now, raising his voice so that all should hear, and said, "'What are you laughing at? Answer! Moreover, please explain to the company why you threw no stone.' "'Are you sure I did not throw a stone?' "'Yes. You needn't try to get out of it. I had my eye on you.' "'And I, I noticed you,' shouted two others. Three witnesses,' said Satan. "'Muller, the blacksmith.' Klein, the butcher's man, Pfeiffer, the weaver's journeyman, three very ordinary liars. Are there any more? Never mind whether there are others or not, and never mind about what you consider us. Three's enough to settle your matter for you. You'll prove that you threw a stone, or it shall go hard with you. That's so, shouted the crowd, and surged up as closely as they could to the center of interest. "'And first you will answer that other question,' cried the blacksmith, pleased with himself for being mouthpiece to the public and hero of the occasion. "'What are you laughing at?' Satan smiled and answered pleasantly, "'To see three cowards stoning a dying lady when they were so near death themselves.' You could see the superstitious crowd shrink and catch their breath under the sudden shock." The blacksmith, with a show of bravado, said, "Pooh! what do you know about it? I? Everything. By profession I am a fortune-teller, and I read the hands of you three, and some others, when you lifted them to stone the woman. One of you will die to-morrow week. Another of you will die to-night. The third has but five minutes to live, and yonder is the clock.' It made a sensation. The faces of the crowd blanched and turned mechanically toward the clock. The butcher and the weaver seemed smitten with an illness. But the blacksmith braced up and said with spirit, It is not long to wait for prediction number one. If it fails, young master, you will not live a whole minute after, I promise you that. No one said anything. All watched the clock in a deep stillness, which was impressive. When four and a half minutes were gone, the blacksmith gave a sudden gasp and clapped his hand upon his heart, saying, Give me breath, give me room, and began to sink down. The crowd surged back, no one offering to support him, and he fell, lumbering to the ground, 
and was dead. The people stared at him, then at Satan, then at one another, and their lips moved, but no words came. Then Satan said, Three saw that I threw no stone. Perhaps there are others. Let them speak. It struck a kind of panic into them, and although no one answered him, many began to violently accuse one another, saying, You said he didn't throw, and getting for a reply, It is a lie, and I will make you eat it. And so, in a moment, they were in a raging and noisy turmoil, and beating and banging one another, and in the midst was the only indifferent one, the dead lady hanging from her rope, her troubles forgotten the spirit at peace. So we walked away, and I was not at ease, but was saying to myself, he told them he was laughing at them, but it was a lie. He was laughing at me. That made him laugh again, and he said, yes, I was laughing at you, because in fear of what others might report about you, you stoned the woman when your heart revolted at the act. But I was laughing at the others, too. Why? Because their case was yours. How is that? Well, there were sixty-eight people there, and sixty-two of them had no more desire to throw a stone than you had. Satan! Oh, it's true, I know your race. It is made up of sheep. It is governed by minorities, seldom or never by majorities. It suppresses its feelings and its beliefs and follows the handful that makes the most noise. Sometimes the noisy handful is right, sometimes wrong, but no matter, the crowd follows it. The vast majority of the race, whether savage or civilized, are secretly kind-hearted and shrink from inflicting pain, but in the presence of the aggressive and pitiless minority they don't dare to assert themselves. Think of it. One kind-hearted creature spies upon another and sees to it that he loyally helps in iniquities which revolt both of them. Speaking as an expert, I know that ninety-nine out of a hundred of your race were strongly against the killing of witches when that foolishness was first agitated by a handful of pious lunatics in the long ago. And I know that even today, after ages of transmitted prejudice and silly teaching, only one person in twenty puts any real heart into the harrying of a witch. And yet, apparently, everybody hates witches and wants them killed. Some day, a handful will rise up on the other side and make the most noise. Perhaps even a single daring man with a big voice and a determined front will do it and in a week all the sheep will wheel and follow him, and witch-hunting will come to a sudden end. Monarchies, aristocracies, and religions are all based upon that large defect in your race, the individual's distrust of his neighbor, and his desire for safety's or comfort's sake to stand well in his neighbor's eye. These institutions will always remain and always flourish and always oppress you, affront you, and degrade you, because you will always be and remain slaves of minorities. There was never a country where the majority of the people were in their secret hearts loyal to any of these institutions. I did not like to hear our race called sheep, and said I did not think they were. "'Still it is true, lamb,' said Satan. "'Look at you in war. What mutton you are, and how ridiculous! "'In war? How? "'There has never been a just one, never an honorable one, "'on the part of the instigator of the war. "'I can see a million years ahead, and this rule will never change "'in so many as half a dozen instances.' The loud little handful, as usual, will shout for the war. The pulpit will, warily and cautiously, object at first. The great big dull bulk of the nation will rub its sleepy eyes and try to make out why there should be a war, and will say earnestly and indignantly, it is unjust and dishonorable, and there is no necessity for it. Then the handful will shout louder. 
A few fair men on the other side will argue and reason against the war with speech and pen, and at first will have a hearing and be applauded, but it will not last long. Those others will outshout them, and presently the anti-war audiences will thin out and lose popularity. Before long you will see this curious thing, the speakers stoned from the platform, and free speech strangled by hordes of furious men who in their secret hearts are still at one with those stoned speakers, as earlier, but do not dare to say so. And now the whole nation, pulpit and all, will take up the war cry, and shout itself hoarse, and mob any man who ventures to open his mouth, and presently such mouths will cease to open. Next the statesman will invent cheap lies, putting the blame upon the nation that is attacked, and every man will be glad of those conscience-soothing falsities, and will diligently study them and refuse to examine any refutations of them. And thus he will by and by convince himself that the war is just, and will thank God for the better sleep he enjoys after this process of grotesque self-deception. Days and days went by now, and no Satan. It was dull without him, but the astrologer, who had returned from his excursion to the moon, went about the village, braving public opinion, and getting a stone in the middle of his back now and then, when some witch-hater got a safe chance to throw it and dodge out of sight. Meantime, two influences had been working well for Margaret that Satan, who was quite indifferent to her, had stopped going to her house after a visit or two, had hurt her pride, and she had set herself the task of banishing him from her heart. Reports of Wilhelm Meidling's dissipation, brought to her from time to time by old Ursula, had touched her with remorse, jealousy of Satan being the cause of it, and so now, these two matters working upon her together, she was getting a good profit out of the combination. Her interest in Satan was steadily cooling, her interest in Wilhelm as steadily warming. All that was needed to complete her conversion was that Wilhelm should brace up and do something that should cause favorable talk and incline the public toward him again. The opportunity came now. Margaret sent and asked him to defend her uncle in the approaching trial, and he was greatly pleased, and stopped drinking and began his preparations with diligence, with more diligence than hope, in fact, for it was not a promising case. He had many interviews in his office with Seppi and me, and threshed out our testimony pretty thoroughly, thinking to find some valuable grains among the chaff, but the harvest was poor, of course." If Satan would only come, that was my constant thought, he could invent some way to win the case, for he had said it would be won, so he necessarily knew how it could be done. But the days dragged on, and still he did not come. Of course, I did not doubt that it would be won, and that Father Peter would be happy for the rest of his life, since Satan had said so. Yet I knew I should be much more comfortable if he would come and tell us how to manage it. It was getting high time for Father Peter to have a saving change toward happiness, for by general report he was worn out with his imprisonment and the ignominy that was burdening him, and was like to die of his miseries unless he got relief soon. At last the trial came on, and the people gathered from all around to witness it, among them many strangers from considerable distances. Yes, everybody was there, except the accused. He was too feeble in body for the strain. But Margaret was present, and keeping up her hope and her spirit the best she could. The money was present, too. It was emptied on the table, and was handled and caressed and examined by such as were privileged. The astrologer was put in the witness-box. He had on his best hat and robe for the occasion. Question. You claim that this money is yours? Answer. I do. How did you come by it? I found the bag in the road when I was returning from a journey. When? 
more than two years ago. What did you do with it? I brought it home and hid it in a secret place in my observatory, intending to find the owner if I could. You endeavored to find him? I made diligent inquiry during several months, but nothing came of it. And then? I thought it not worth while to look further, and was minded to use the money in finishing the wing of the foundling asylum connected with the priory and nunnery. So I took it out of its hiding place, and counted it to see if any of it was missing, and then, why do you stop? Proceed! I am sorry to have to say this, but just as I had finished and was restoring the bag to its place, I looked up, and there stood Father Peter behind me. Several murmured, that looks bad, but others answered, ah, but he is such a liar. That made you uneasy? No. I thought nothing of it at the time, for Father Peter often came to me, unannounced, to ask for a little help in his need. Margaret blushed crimson at hearing her uncle falsely and impudently charged with begging, especially from one he had always denounced as a fraud, and was going to speak, but remembered herself in time and held her peace. Proceed! In the end I was afraid to contribute the money to the foundling asylum, but elected to wait yet another year and continue my inquiries. When I heard of Father Peter's find, I was glad, and no suspicion entered my mind. When I came home a day or two later and discovered that my own money was gone, I still did not suspect until three circumstances connected with Father Peter's good fortune struck me as being singular coincidences. Pray, name them. Father Peter had found his money in a path. I had found mine in a road. Father Peter's find consisted exclusively of gold ducats. Mine also. Father Peter found eleven hundred and seven ducats. I exactly the same. This closed his evidence, and certainly it made a strong impression on the house. One could see that. Wilhelm Meidling asked him some questions, then called us boys, and we told our tale. It made the people laugh, and we were ashamed. We were feeling pretty badly, anyhow, because Wilhelm was hopeless and showed it. He was doing as well as he could, poor young fellow, but nothing was in his favor, and such sympathy as there was was now plainly not with his client. It might be difficult for court and people to believe the astrologer's story, considering his character, but it was almost impossible to believe Father Peter's. We were already feeling badly enough, but when the astrologer's lawyer said he believed he would not ask us any questions, for our story was a little delicate, and it would be cruel for him to put any strain upon it, everybody tittered, and it was almost more than we could bear. Then he made a sarcastic little speech, and got so much fun out of our tale, and it seemed so ridiculous and childish, and every way impossible and foolish, that it made everybody laugh till the tears came. And at last Margaret could not keep up her courage any longer, but broke down and cried, and I was so sorry for her. Now I noticed something that braced me up. It was Satan standing alongside of Wilhelm, and there was such a contrast. Satan looked so confident, had such a spirit in his eyes and face, and Wilhelm looked so depressed and despondent. We two were comfortable now, and judged that he would testify and persuade the bench and the people that black was white and white black, or any other color he wanted it. We glanced around to see what the strangers in the house thought of him, for he was beautiful, you know, stunning, in fact, but no one was noticing him, so we knew by that that he was invisible. The lawyer was saying his last words, and while he was saying them, Satan began to melt into Wilhelm. He melted into him and disappeared, and then there was a change when his spirit began to look out of Wilhelm's eyes. That lawyer finished quite seriously and with dignity. He pointed to the money and said, The love of it is the root of all evil. 
there it lies, the ancient tempter, newly red with the shame of its latest victory, the dishonor of a priest of God and his two poor juvenile helpers in crime. If it could but speak, let us hope that it would be constrained to confess that, of all its conquests, this was the basest and the most pathetic. He sat down. Wilhelm rose and said, From the testimony of the accuser, I gather that he found this money in a road more than two years ago. Correct me, sir, if I misunderstood you. The astrologer said his understanding of it was correct. And the money so found was never out of his hands, thenceforth up to a certain definite date, the last day of last year. Correct me, sir, if I am wrong. The astrologer nodded his head. Wilhelm turned to the bench and said, If I prove that this money here was not that money, then it is not his? Certainly not, but this is irregular. If you had such a witness, it was your duty to give proper notice of it and have him here to— He broke off and began to consult with the other judges. Meantime, that other lawyer got up excited and began to protest against allowing new witnesses to be brought into the case at this late stage. The judges decided that his contention was just, and must be allowed. But this is not a new witness, said Wilhelm. It has already been partly examined. I speak of the coin. The coin? What can the coin say? It can say it is not the coin that the astrologer once possessed. It can say it was not in existence last December. By its date it can say this. And it was so. There was the greatest excitement in the court, while that lawyer and the judges were reaching for coins and examining them and exclaiming, and everybody was full of admiration of Wilhelm's brightness in happening to think of that neat idea. At last order was called, and the court said, All of the coins but four are of the date of the present year. The court tenders its sincere sympathy to the accused, and its deep regret that he, an innocent man, through an unfortunate mistake, has suffered the undeserved humiliation of imprisonment and trial. The case is dismissed. So the money could speak after all, though that lawyer thought it couldn't. The court rose, and almost everybody came forward to shake hands with Margaret and congratulate her, and then to shake with Wilhelm and praise him. And Satan had stepped out of Wilhelm and was standing around looking on, full of interest, and people walking through him every which way, not knowing he was there. And Wilhelm could not explain why he only thought of the date on the coins at the last moment instead of earlier. He said it just occurred to him all of a sudden, like an inspiration, and he brought it right out without any hesitation, for, although he didn't examine the coins, he seemed somehow to know it was true. That was honest of him, and like him. Another would have pretended he had thought of it earlier and was keeping it back for a surprise. He had dulled down a little now, not much, but still you could notice that he hadn't that luminous look in his eyes that he had while Satan was in him. He nearly got it back, though, for a moment, when Margaret came and praised him and thanked him, and couldn't keep him from seeing how proud she was of him. The astrologer went off dissatisfied and cursing, and Solomon Isaacs gathered up the money and carried it away. It was Father Peter's for good and all now. Satan was gone. I judged that he had spirited himself away to the jail to tell the prisoner the news, and in this I was right. Margaret and the rest of us hurried thither at our best speed, in a great state of rejoicing. Well, what Satan had done was this. He had appeared before that poor prisoner, exclaiming, The trial is over, and you stand forever disgraced as a thief. By verdict of the court, the shock unseated the old man's reason. When we arrived ten minutes later, he was parading pompously up and down, and delivering commands to this and that and the other constable or jailer, and calling them Grand Chamberlain and Prince this and Prince that, and Admiral of the Fleet, Field Marshal in command, and such fustian, and was as happy as a bird. He thought he was emperor." Margaret flung herself on his breast and cried, and indeed everybody was moved almost to heartbreak. 
He recognized Margaret, but could not understand why she should cry. He patted her on the shoulder and said, Don't do it, dear. Remember, there are witnesses, and it is not becoming in the crown princess. Tell me your trouble. It shall be mended. There is nothing the emperor cannot do. Then he looked around and saw old Ursula with her apron to her eyes. He was puzzled at that and said, And what is the matter with you? Through her sobs she got out words explaining that she was distressed to see him so. He reflected over that a moment, then muttered as if to himself, A singular thing, the dowager duchess. Means well, but is always snuffling and never able to tell what it is about. It is because she doesn't know. His eyes fell on Wilhelm. Prince of India, he said, I divine that it is you that the crown princess is concerned about. Her tears shall be dried. I will no longer stand between you. She shall share your throne, and between you you shall inherit mine. There, little lady, have I done well. You can smile now, isn't it so? He petted Margaret and kissed her and was so contented with himself and with everybody that he could not do enough for us all, but began to give away kingdoms and such right and left, and the least that any of us got was a principality. And so, at last, being persuaded to go home, he marched in an imposing state, and when the crowds along the way saw how it gratified him to be hurrahed at, they humored him to the top of his desire, and he responded with condescending bows and gracious smiles, and often stretched out a hand and said, Bless you, my people, as pitiful a sight as ever I saw. And Margaret and old Ursula crying all the way. On my road home I came upon Satan and reproached him with deceiving me with that lie. He was not embarrassed, but said quite simply and composedly, Ah, you mistake. It was the truth. I said he would be happy the rest of his days, and he will, for he will always think he is the emperor, and his pride in it and his joy in it will endure to the end. He is now and will remain the one utterly happy person in this empire. But the method of it, Satan, the method! Couldn't you have done it without depriving him of his reason? It was difficult to irritate Satan, but that accomplished it. What an ass you are, he said. Are you so unobservant as not to have found out that sanity and happiness are an impossible combination? No sane man can be happy, for to him life is real, and he sees what a fearful thing it is. Only the mad can be happy, and not many of those. The few that imagine themselves kings or gods are happy. The rest are no happier than the sane. Of course, no man is entirely in his right mind at any time, but I have been referring to the extreme cases. I have taken from this man that trumpery thing which the race regards as a mind. I have replaced his tin life with a silver gilt fiction. You see the result, and you criticize. I said I would make him permanently happy, and I have done it. I have made him happy, by the only means possible to his race. And you are not satisfied. He heaved a discouraged sigh and said, It seems to me that this race is hard to please. There it was, you see. He didn't seem to know any way to do a person a favor, except by killing him or making a lunatic out of him. I apologized as well as I could, but privately I did not think much of his processes at that time. Satan was accustomed to say that our race lived a life of continuous and uninterrupted self-deception. It duped itself from cradle to grave with shams and delusions which it mistook for realities, and this made its entire life a sham. Of the score of fine qualities which it imagined it had and was vain of, it really possessed hardly one. It regarded itself as gold and was only brass. One day, when he was in this vein, he mentioned a detail, the sense of humor. I cheered up then and took issue. I said we possessed it. 
There spoke the race, he said, always ready to claim what it hasn't got and mistake its ounce of brass filings for a ton of gold dust. You have a mongrel perception of humor, nothing more. A multitude of you possess that. This multitude see the comic side of a thousand low-grade and trivial things, broad incongruities mainly, grotesqueries, absurdities, evokers of the horse-laugh, the ten thousand high-grade comicalities which exist in the world are sealed from their dull vision. Will a day come when the race will detect the funniness of these juvenilities and laugh at them? and by laughing at them, destroy them. For your race in its poverty has unquestionably one really effective weapon. Laughter. Power, money, persuasion, supplication, persecution, these can lift at a colossal humbug, push it a little, weaken it a little, century by century, but only laughter can blow it to rags and atoms at a blast. Against the assault of laughter, nothing can stand. You're always fussing and fighting with your other weapons. Do you ever use that one? No. You leave it lying, rusting. As a race, do you ever use it at all? No. You lack sense and the courage. We were traveling at the time and stopped at a little city in India and looked on while a juggler did his tricks before a group of natives. They were wonderful, but I knew Satan could beat that game, and I begged him to show off a little, and he said he would. He changed himself into a native in turban and breechcloth, and very considerately conferred on me a temporary knowledge of the language. The juggler exhibited a seed, covered it with earth in a small flower pot, then put a rag over the pot. After a minute the rag began to rise. In ten minutes it had risen a foot. Then the rag was removed, and a little tree was exposed, with leaves upon it and ripe fruit. We ate the fruit, and it was good. But Satan said, Why do you cover the pot? Can't you grow the tree in sunlight? No, said the juggler. No one can do that. You are only an apprentice. You don't know your trade. Give me the seed. I will show you. He took the seed and said, What shall I raise from it? It is a cherry seed. Of course you will raise a cherry. Oh, no, that is a trifle. Any novice can do that. Shall I raise an orange tree from it? Oh, yes. And the juggler laughed. And shall I make it bear other fruits as well as oranges? If God wills, and they all laughed. Satan put the seed in the ground, put a handful of dust on it, and said, Rise! A tiny stem shot up and began to grow, and grew so fast that in five minutes it was a great tree, and we were sitting in the shade of it. There was a murmur of wonder. Then all looked up and saw a strange and pretty sight, for the branches were heavy with fruits of many kinds and colors, oranges, grapes, bananas, peaches, cherries, apricots, and so on. Baskets were brought, and the unlading of the tree began, and the people crowded around Satan and kissed his hand and praised him, calling him the Prince of Jugglers. The news went about the town, and everybody came running to see the wonder, and they remembered to bring baskets, too. But the tree was equal to the occasion. It put out new fruits as fast as any were removed. Baskets were filled by the score and by the hundred, but always the supply remained undiminished. At last a foreigner in white linen and sun helmet arrived and exclaimed angrily, Away from here! Clear out, you dogs! The tree is on my lands and is my property! The natives put down their baskets and made humble obeisance. Satan made humble obeisance, too, with his fingers to his forehead in the native way, and said, Please let them have their pleasure for an hour, sir, only that and no longer. Afterward you may forbid them, and you will still have more fruit than you and the state together can consume in a year. This made the foreigner very angry, and he cried out, Who are you, you vagabond, to tell your betters what they may do and what they mayn't? 
and he struck Satan with his cane and followed this error with a kick. The fruits rotted on the branches, and the leaves withered and fell. The foreigner gazed at the bare limbs with the look of one who is surprised and not gratified. Satan said, Take good care of the tree, for its health and yours are bound together. It will never bear again, but if you tend it well, it will live long. Water its roots once in each hour every night, and do it yourself. It must not be done by proxy, and to do it in daylight will not answer. If you fail only once in any night, the tree will die, and you likewise. Do not go home to your own country any more. You would not reach there. Make no business or pleasure engagements which require you to go outside your gate at night. You cannot afford the risk. Do not rent or sell this place. It would be injudicious. The foreigner was proud and wouldn't beg, but I thought he looked as if he would like to. While he stood gazing at Satan, we vanished away and landed in Ceylon. I was sorry for that man, sorry Satan hadn't been his customary self and killed him or made him a lunatic. It would have been a mercy. Satan overheard the thought and said, I would have done it but for his wife, who has not offended me. She is coming to him presently from their native land, Portugal. She is well, but has not long to live, and has been yearning to see him and persuade him to go back with her next year. She will die without knowing he can't leave that place. He won't tell her. He, he will not trust that secret with any one. He will reflect that it could be revealed in sleep, in the hearing of some Portuguese guest's servant some time or other. Did none of those natives understand what you said to him? None of them understood, but he will always be afraid that some of them did. That fear will be torture to him, for he has been a harsh master to them. In his dreams he will imagine them chopping his tree down. That will make his days uncomfortable. I have already arranged for his nights. It grieved me, though not sharply, to see him take such a malicious satisfaction in his plans for this foreigner. Does he believe what you told him, Satan? He thought he didn't, but our vanishing helped. The tree where there had been no tree before, that helped. The insane and uncanny variety of fruits, the sudden withering, all these things are helps. Let him think as he may, reason as he may, one thing is certain, he will water the tree. But between this and night he will begin his changed career, with a very natural precaution for him. What is that? He will fetch a priest to cast out the tree's devil. <laughs> you are such a humorous race and don't suspect it. Will he tell the priest? No. He will say a juggler from Bombay created it, and that he wants the juggler's devil driven out of it, so that it will thrive and be fruitful again. The priest's incantations will fail, then the Portuguese will give up that scheme and get his watering pot ready. Mm. But the priest will burn the tree. I know it. He will not allow it to remain. Yes, and anywhere in Europe he would burn the man, too. But in India the people are civilized, and these things will not happen. The man will drive the priest away and take care of the tree. I reflected a little, then said, Satan, you have given him a hard life, I think. Comparatively, it must not be mistaken for a holiday. We flitted from place to place around the world as we had done before. Satan showing me a hundred wonders, most of them reflecting in some way the weakness and triviality of our race. He did this now every few days, not out of malice, I am sure of that. It only seemed to amuse and interest him, just as a naturalist might be amused and interested by a collection of ants. 